Now that you've come up with your topic, I'm going to be talking about how you can actually research your speech. I'll be focusing on where do you find sources, how do you test them to make sure they're good sources, and how do you actually put them in your speech. Now before I talk about that, the first thing I want to address with research is Google. So again, I have to bring it up. Now this is where most people go and Google can be a great source, but it also can be one that you might want to avoid. The reason being is because studies have found that millennials, those born between the 1980s and the 2000s, are not that good at using Google as a resource. Here's another article from Inside Higher Ed, and this study looked at three universities at Illinois to basically find, and this is a quote, uh, that students really couldn't return good sources, right? They couldn't build a search that would do that. And I don't think this is something that's specific to millennials. I actually think this is something that everyone deals with. This is from the Washington Post, and their research found that majority of people actually look at just the first thing that they find on Google, which is a big problem. And let me give you an example of why. And the example I'm calling the Google Dinosaur. So right now I'm at a blank Google page and I'm going to type in this question, what happened to dinosaurs? The first thing that pops up, which remember most people look at, is something that comes from the Bible, which is historically and scientifically not accurate when it comes to dinosaurs. This is actually something that's been up since May. This is what this particular source is addressing. Uh, and people have petitioned Google to take this answer down, and it actually has not been taken down. We're still in August at this point. So that's why you have to be careful with Google. You have to have some level of skepticism of the way in which you use Google and what you find from Google. So now that we've talked about the issue with Google, let's discuss what's going to be addressed in this video. First, I'll be talking about how do you determine if something's a credible source, how do you properly use Google, which you have to do it with caution, and how do you use the databases and access books digitally. So let's first start with how do you determine a source is good. The way in which to do that is through the CRAAP test. The CRAAP test is an acronym, as odd as it may sound, that breaks down into these categories. Currency, relevancy, authority, accuracy, and purpose. So let me go through them. Currency is basically just going to focus on is your source new? Is it something that's current? Five to ten years is the typical rule of thumb, but the caveat is it's going to depend on your topic. So for instance, if you have a technological topic or something that deals with medicine or science, three, five years might be the rule of thumb that you want to use, especially with technology. Three years, something might be ancient. Where on the other hand, if you're dealing with Shakespeare, five to ten years might actually not be enough time. Because think about it, the interpretation of Romeo and Juliet may not even change in 15 years. And I can bet you that the information we know on Shakespeare, like where he was born or when his plays were published, that's not going to change in 15 or 20 years. So again, you really have to use your judgment. If you ever have a question, just ask me. When we're talking about the relevancy, you want to ask yourself, does this directly connect to your topic and project? Now that might seem like an obvious question, right? Your research needs to be within the realm of your speech topic. But you also want to consider the appropriateness of it, right? Does it properly connect to your audience? So if it's something that's offensive or explicit, don't include it. Or if it's not something that's appropriate in the sense that an academic college course probably wouldn't want it, then don't put it in there. Authority. This is another important thing, right? Who is the source? So if I'm doing a speech on cancer, the American Medical Association would be a great source. Where Dr. Oz, probably not as much. Yes, he is a doctor. However, he's also an entertainer, and a lot of the things that he's said on his show have been proven to be false. So you really have to be careful with these kinds of things. What you want to ask yourself is, what credentials do they have? And this is of an institution, of an individual, of a website, all of these sorts of things you want to ask. What are the credentials? How can they prove their authority? Specifically with websites, things you want to look out for are URLs that end, in particular, with .edu and .gov. That would, of course, mean they're from educational and governmental websites. .org can be good, though you do also have to be careful with that. You then need to go back to that question of do they have credentials, right, for the organization that you're dealing with. Another thing is 
accuracy. And this actually is probably the most important thing that you actually could ask in the crap test. Without this, all the other ones don't count. Let me give you an example. I had a student who wanted to do her speech topic on vaccines and autism. And she wanted to talk about how vaccines actually cause autism. This was a couple of years ago. And a lot of the source material she found came from this guy, who, whose name, unfortunately, I'm forgetting right now. But he basically falsified research, saying that there was a connection. He published it. Once the journal realized he falsified it, they retracted the article. But a lot of what she was finding was basically going back to this information. So she really couldn't find a lot that was really credible and essentially found things saying that our rates of vaccines have actually radically decreased, but our rates of autism are going up. So that fact in and of itself kind of disproved that theory. So it's really important that you actually have more than just a handful of sources, particularly credible sources, going back to the, the first A of authority that you can really find. Another thing that's important to question is the purpose, right? What is the goal of the particular person or institution that you're getting information from? So let's look at two examples. This is Bill O'Reilly from the Fox News Network, and this is Nancy Grace from CNN. Now, both of these individuals have journalistic and or legal backgrounds, which would make them credible. However, they're also on shows, which makes them entertainers, right? Their goal is to... Uh, titillate the audience to some degree to get them angry or uh, upset or passionate about a particular issue. In the same way that the National Rifle Association and the Brady campaign both have agendas, right? One wants less gun control, the other wants the opposite. That's not to say that the information coming from any of these groups or individuals in and of themselves is inaccurate. What you want to do is be careful of the slant that they're giving to this information. Because they have a purpose beyond just the journalistic or informative, there's the possibility that they could shade the information in a way that doesn't represent it in its most truest form. So you do want to be careful about that. And there's other sources out there that are better than all of these. So stay away from them. So the crap test can be really effective, again, at pinpointing good sources. I have a worksheet on my faculty page that you can utilize in order to determine whether one is good or not. It actually gives you a scoring process, so I'd recommend looking at that. But I also want to show you how this works in practice. So this is a particular issue that's come under controversy recently, Planned Parenthood and the Selling of Fetal Tissue. For those who are not familiar with this issue, the Center for Medical Progress in the last couple of weeks has um, published some undercover videos that assert that Planned Parenthood has been profiting from the sale of fetal tissue. What I'm going to do right now is show a quick clip from CNN just to kind of catch you up on the issue, and then we'll talk about the information that this group has released and apply the crap test to it. If we were doing like you know 50 to 75 per specimen, that'd be like gender 300. But like, we'd be comfortable with that. But like, so it's like stuff like this. Like we don't want to do like just a flat fee of like 200, and then you know, it's like. <laughs> no, and you know, the, uh, I, I think the I think the per item thing works a little better just because we can see how much we can get out of it. That was a clip from a series of Sting videos shot by an anti-abortion group that appear to reveal Planned Parenthood negotiating prices for fetal tissue. These controversial videos have prompted Congress to once again attempt to defund Planned Parenthood. And joining us now is the man behind those videos, David Daleiden. David, thanks so much for being on New Day. Thanks for having me on, Allison. Okay, David, let's talk about what we just saw in that clip and others that you've released. It, it appears that there's some sort of negotiation going on, and what Planned Parenthood says is that it's about the transfer of fetal tissue to biotech companies that will use them for research. And all Planned Parenthood says they're trying to do is to cover their costs for handling or storing or need be to get reimbursed for that. They say that they're not selling the fetal tissue. And by the way, handling covering costs for the transfer is totally legal so where do you think the smoking gun is 
Right. So there's basically two points there. The first point is that Planned Parenthood is very openly admitting that they do harvest the fetal tissue and they do receive payments in connection with that. So then that means the second point, the only question is really, do the, are those payments constituting a financial benefit to Planned Parenthood and is it constituting a profit that's greater than whatever costs real or imagined they might have for actually supplying the fetal tissue. And when Planned Parenthood partners with a middleman biotech company to allow those technicians to come into their clinic and harvest the body parts, Planned Parenthood actually doesn't incur any costs from the harvesting of the fetal organs. Mm. Because the technicians are the ones who are doing all the consenting of the patients, they're packaging the tissue, they're dissecting the fetuses, they're shipping it off. All of those costs are absorbed by the biotech company, and yet Planned Parenthood is still getting paid $50, $75, even $100 per specimen just yeah. from supplying the aborted fetus. Okay, Planned Parenthood disputes that. They say that it is their staff that is doing the consenting, getting the consents from the patients, as well as if they have to do some sort of storage or at least transfer. But we had the uh, executive vice president of Planned Parenthood on New Day this week. Her name is Dawn Legans. And again, she says that they are simply trying to cover their costs. So now let's look at the crap test. If we're going to apply each of these things, obviously this is current, this is something that's really uh, new right now. And of course it's also actually important and relevant because of the fact that many presidential candidates, particularly on the Republican side, are now asking to defund Planned Parenthood. Now, accuracy, I know I'm switching the A's here, but accuracy is probably a really important question to ask. Unfortunately, there's not a lot of evidence really showing that they do, in fact, profit off of it. So this is from that same article I just had up from Time Magazine, basically saying that there's really no evidence showing this, that any of the costs that they talked about in the actual video that they released just cover the administration in handling fees, and in fact that the video was edited to make it sound like they were profiting. While accuracy has been debunked, let's also look at authority. So who is the group that's releasing this? Like I said, this is the Center for Medical Progress. Uh, it was mentioned in the CNN clip that they are an anti-abortion group. So again, they have an agenda. So that's why you have to be especially careful about it. Now I'm at their website just to show you what it is. If you look at About Us, one thing that they say is they're a group of citizen journalists. So that too is also a bit... Uh, questionable in the fact that they're not actual trained journalists. So you would have to look at sources beyond what they're putting and other sources that are journalistic have found that a lot of the claims being made are not true. And then of course purpose, again the agenda, so authority and purpose really closely connect here. They are really trying to enact political change, which for the most part they have been successful. Many, like I said, candidates are looking at defunding this. There's also a debate currently in, the co in Congress right now. But ultimately this would not pass the crap test. Yes, it is current and yes, it is relevant, but the two A's and P really showcase that in fact this is not something that can be trusted. It. The next thing we're going to focus on is where you can actually find sources. So now that you know how to test them, let's talk about where you can get them. So the first is databases and journals, and these are really important places to get really credible, good information. The first thing I'm going to talk about is how can you access the Palm Beach State databases, because you have access to them both on and off campus. So how you're going to actually access them is through the college's home page. Now keep in mind, like I said, you can access this off campus and on campus. When you're off campus, you want to go to the Palm Beach State website and log into PantherWeb. Once you've logged in there, you need to go to the library link. Now again, you have to go through PantherWeb to actually get on. Once you've done that, you can click on databases A through Z. It'll give you a whole list of databases. There's other options, but again, you can click on any of them. Typically, I'd recommend these first ones here, the academic ones. Those are really good. Once you actually go in, as you notice up here, you can type in a keyword, and then what's going to happen for whatever database you're in, this one is Gale, it'll pull up a bunch of different sources. So you can scroll through and find a lot of different different things. Again, if you ever need help with sources, you can always go to the library itself or of course they actually have different search functions, so using the web page as well. 
These are some other examples of different databases you can go into. So this is biography and context. Again, if you go back to that list, it's in alphabetical order with databases A to Z. This is good if you're talking about a specific person or need more information. Opposing viewpoints actually is a great one for our class, especially for the persuasive speech and the argumentative speech. This is one of the databases you'll definitely want to keep in mind and go back to. Some other databases that you can actually utilize, not just for this class but for other classes things like health and wellness for the informative speech if you're doing a topic in relationship to that that can be good literary reference science there's all sorts of things that you can use so keep in mind go to those databases and you can get it from the college's website so remember the databases are where you can get journals periodicals and even things from books so when I'm saying databases and journals journals is also part of what's in the databases so again go through Panther web click on the library some other things are of course you can use Google what I'm going to be talking about in a second are different Google functions and those break down to Google Books Google in-depth articles Google Scholar and Google News so I'm on a blank Google page I'm going to type in yoga just as kind of a very broad subject area to search now again most people typically would be clicking on these first three things. One thing to note, yoga, as far as Wikipedia, not a good source. Please, please, please do not use yoga. And wasn't expecting this one, but whatever. So moving on, what I want you to do is click on the more function. That's where you're really going to start to get some better search um, abilities. First one I'm going to cover is books. So you click on more and then books and again it's going to keep yoga. So what Google's going to do is access all the books that it can possibly get and Google has access to a lot of different books. So you'll notice here it says preview on each of these. This one for instance says no preview. When it says that, that means you cannot access the book. When it says you do have a preview, you can access most of the book. Um, sometimes you can access a book in its entirety. Sometimes there's a limited preview, so it's going to depend on the book. But typically you can access a lot of good information. So to show you how to do this, I'm going to click on this book right here. What it does is going to give you the entire book or most of the book depending on the copyright issues. Now at this point you might be thinking she's expecting us to read an entire book. This woman's crazy. No, I'm not expecting you to read a book for a speech that you might have you know two weeks to prepare for. I can't require multiple book readings. So what you do want to do is go over to this function right here and in this search now that we've talked about yoga we need to specify what it is that we're looking so let's say you know because we talked about diaphragmatic breathing I put breathing in this search function once I hit that what it's gonna do is go through the entire book and find out where is this in the book and I, there's actually a lot which isn't surprising because of course yoga has to do with breathing so I can click on any one of these pages and it'll take me to the exact page and highlight every single place which it said a lot on this page and then I can go back to view all and go back say I want to check out this page and again it'll highlight it so what Google Books is really good at is very quickly you can access credible information if the book of course is a really solid book and you don't have to read the entire book so you can access a lot of this put things in your speech that are from an actual book without again having to go through the entire process of searching yourself so technology is a wonderful thing all right to go back so this is taking me to Google Books I'm just gonna go to Google itself but you could actually look at Google Books if you just wanted to type that in and get to that so again I'm gonna type in the same search function now I mentioned news and in-depth articles those basically overlap into this news function right here sometimes um, I'm on Firefox on Internet Explorer it sometimes comes up as in-depth articles so it depends on the browser you use but right here it's going to pull up all of the articles news articles right whether it's from you know local sources uh, we have for instance the Palm Beach Post here or the Huffington Post some more national sources ESPN all sorts of stuff and it's all recent right 14 hours ago 
this is really good too if you're trying to fine tune your topic that it really shows you what is the conversation that's going on what are the issues that are going on around this particular issue so this is another thing that you can use that'll really help not only inform what you're talking about but maybe steer the particular direction of where you want to go now the next thing sometimes on the more function it'll pull down more so again the browser is going to uh, depend on what you do here it's obviously not so you can either click on search tool Tools. On Firefox, that doesn't work as well, so I'm going to go over here. But again, it's going to depend on what your browser looks like. I'll click on More and then Even More. And now it's going to pull up basically everything that Google can do, which there's a lot, obviously. I'm going to go down to Specialized Search, and that's where we get into Google Scholar. Now, Google Scholar is similar to Google Books. It's basically going to find all of the periodicals and journals and things that a database could find. So obviously, Scholar is looking at more of the academic research. Books is, of course, looking at books. So I'll type in, again, the same search function. And what it's going to do is pull up a lot of those things I was mentioning, right? This is a science magazine. These right here are journals. Um, sometimes it'll pull up governmental documents as well, one right here actually. But you might notice this is from 1985. That actually, especially when we're talking about this is health related from what I can see of the title, is really old. So you can actually fine tune your search right here. Let's say I only want things from 2011. Done. I can get them. You'll also notice too that it's pulling up this right here, find text at Palm Beach State. This is because I'm on a Palm Beach State uh, computer right now. So if you do this at Palm Beach State, it'll actually connect to our databases and take you directly into that in case there's any copywriting issues as to why it wouldn't come up. When there's a blank space, that means you may not be able to pull it up. So that might be something you want to keep in mind. That some of these articles, again, just like books, Google may not have the copyright access to it. I'm going to click on this one right here just to show you. So it's going to pull up as a PDF. So it's asking how I want to open it. Now, this is a rather, oh, I didn't need that. Okay, this is a rather dense article. Um, what I would suggest too, obviously you can read through it, but to really pinpoint again what you want to look for, you can search through this similarly to what we did with Google Books. What you want to hit is Control and then F. When you do that, it's going to come up with this search function right here. Uh, I am going to choose extract just because I already know what's in there I want to show you and what it'll do is show you everything that has that word in it and very quickly you can comb the document for every possible place this word is actually in here a lot uh, for that so again this is another really good thing you can also actually do that on websites or really any um, online document so that might be something you keep in mind too if you're using like an organization's website or an educational or governmental website and you very quickly want to get through it find a keyword that you're looking for and hit control F so those are the ways in which you can use Google again Google Scholar news and in-depth articles it's going to be different depending on the browser and Google book so now that I've talked about how to use Google and the databases, what we want to talk next is how do you actually cite this information? There's going to be two ways. The first way is through a works cited or bibliography page that you'll have to turn in for these speeches. So I'm going to recommend using a citation generator, and I'll talk about what that is in a second. There's many out there, but the one I recommend is easybib.com. So let me show you how that works. All right, so I'm back at Google Books, right, because we found a source here. I'm going to click on this book instead just to show you a different example. So the reason I'm coming here is because you have to go back to your sources in order to put them in the citation. I just copied the title of the book, and I'm here at EasyBib. So again, just to get to this source, it'd be EasyBib.com, and this is what pulls up. So the first source that we just had was a book. The way in which you use it is you pick the source that you're going to be citing, and there's a lot of sources if you click on this option, but book. What you can do, it even says here the ISBN, the title or keyword. I'm going to type in the title of this book, and it pulled up right here. So I would then click on Cite This. What it's going to do is pull up the information as far as publication, the city, the year it was published, the title, the authors. Now, I always want you to go back and actually check. So one thing, too, and this is important to notice, it's saying that it was actually published in 2012. 
So let me go to the copyright page, which is where you can always, that's usually like the second or third page. So see, it's 2007. That's probably what um, EasyBib's pulling up, where this says 2012. The authors, it looks like, are correct, what it pulled up. So I'm going to go back, and you can always edit this. I'm going to put 2012. And of course, you can also, if you're using an ebook online or an online database, you can actually put that here too. So I could say, for instance, that I got this as the URL from right here, put that in. Okay, sorry, it's getting a little funky there, and put that in. Um, you don't actually have to. This is using, by the way, MLA format. I failed to mention that. You don't actually have to put that in. You can to put it in. Uh, and the date I accessed it was today, so then create citation. And then this is ultimately what's going to come up. If you use, say, a website. So let me try and find a yoga website. I don't know if yoga.com is in. I'm sure it is. Okay, it is an actual website. Good to know. Uh, so let's say I used this right here. I would then copy this particular website and then put it in right here. And then it's going to pull up the information. So you'll see, too, it's not giving all of the information. Again, like I corrected before, sometimes you can actually uh, go back in. So just say continue. And let's say there is no author, right? Sometimes on websites, there's not a particular author. I'm not seeing anyone here. I'm getting a copyright for this particular company. You could use that as the author or the actual, I'm going to correct that to the actual person or, of course, the uh, yoga.com as the author itself. Electronically published, I'm getting 2004 or excuse me, 2014 is the copyright. So I can always put that in there if you don't have a specific date. So again, some of this information on websites, you can always go to the very bottom, and usually what you find there is what you're going to end up being uh, using. So let me correct that, and it's actually called poses. So this is actually a good example because I am having to clean up some of this information, and you can do that. Sometimes EasyBib will come up with all the information and it'll be perfect, but I think this is good because you can see that, in fact, sometimes if you have to change it, you can. Now it's going to create the citation. This is the citation. Now this is also another really great feature. It's actually alphabetizing these sources. And then what you can do, now let's say I have all my sources. Let's pretend I'm just using these two. I can go into exporting this. So if you want to copy and paste it, I'm going to go here to print. Now I'm not actually going to print the document. What you can do is click on download. And then this is what's going to be pulled up, right? So it's going to give you a works cited page set up for you in the correct format. So this is really a run, a wonderful, excuse me, tool. Now, like I said, EasyVib is the one I recommend. There's a lot of citation generators out there, so it's up to you if you have another one. Uh, our library uses Noodle tools. I find that to not be as user friendly, but again, it's really up to you. And of course, you don't even have to use a citation generator. If you want to do it old school, by all means, go right ahead. Head, I'd recommend probably using technology and then just double checking to make sure everything's okay. So now that we've talked about how to cite it in your bibliography, we next need to talk about how you're going to put the sources in your speech. And one thing that's really important to talk about with this is the way in which you do that to avoid plagiarism. So plagiarism basically breaks down to using someone someone's ideas and taking credit for it. So let me give you a brief overview of how plagiarism works. A lot of people have ideas, right? And some of those ideas are really good ones and they end up here in books or periodicals or newspapers or wherever. Now when you're researching for your speech, you as a student are going to encounter some of those sources. Now the problem becomes when you put them in your speech or in your paper and you don't say where you got them from, it's basically like you're saying that that was my idea. If you don't tell me where you're getting the information from, then you are saying you had that idea and not that it's someone else. And when you take someone else's idea, that is a huge problem. So keep in mind a rule of thumb. If you didn't know it before you encountered the source, cite it. So how do you actually do that? Citations. What's important to do in the speech and in your outline is that you put where you got it from. 
So you need to verbally cite, right? So orally tell me where you got it from, and then also cite it. The ways to do that is to mention the author and the credibility if it's not known. I'll show you an example of what I mean in a second. Or let's say there's no author from the source. This could be from the organization that published the information, the website, whatever it is. Just tell me where you got it from, something that's going to connect it. So let me give you some examples. Here's one Joel Stein wrote in Time Magazine, so that not only tells me the author, but where they got it from. Uh, Dr. Schwartzman in his textbook, so again, both the author and where they got it from. And then here's one too, Dr. Fisher, and then they say a communication professor at Northwest. So that's actually citing the credibility. Remember, if your audience does not know the credibility of your source, right, why they would have some sort of authority, going back to the crap test, then you really do need to cite that, fill that information in for them. Now there's multiple ways to cite something orally, according to, asserts, goes on to say, reflects, explains. These are only some examples, but you do want to say either the author or the source. Another thing that's really important when avoiding plagiarism is understanding that you can't just copy and paste a source and be fine. You need to understand that in order to avoid it, you have to understand the difference between quotations and paraphrasing. And there's a really important nuance between the two that will especially be important because otherwise you're going to be treading the line of plagiarism. So let's first start with quotes. Obviously, you don't want to use a lot of them. It's only best to use a quote if an author is saying something and you really can't say it any differently without it sounding exactly like what they're saying. So if you take the words of the authors, you have to put quotes around this. And so many times students miss this. So let me give you an example. Here's an article from the New York Times. And this is what it actually states in the article itself. So if someone puts this in their speech, right, as Alvarez states, and then the rest of this information is here, the way I look at this is that it's Alvarez's idea, but these words over here are your own. They're not hers. But in fact, this is actually a direct quote. Until you put these around it, I think it's your own words. And if you don't have these marks, these quotation marks here, you're plagiarizing because you're saying these are my own words when in fact they're not. It's the author's idea and their own words. So when we come to that issue, what we're dealing with is paraphrasing. So paraphrasing is taking someone's ideas, right? Both with quotes and paraphrasing, we're dealing with someone's ideas. The difference with paraphrasing is you're taking their idea but putting it in your own words. You still have to give credit, but you don't need to put quotes. Now keep in mind, paraphrasing is not changing a couple of words. It really does have to sound like your own wording. So an example, if the original source was her life spanned years of incredible change for women, and you then put her life spanned years of immense change for ladies, which never put ladies for women, but <laughs> that's besides the point, this actually would not count as paraphrasing. You're still basically using the same wording, so you would have to put quotes, and of course if you're going to put quotes, you might as well just use what the original was. Now if you changed from the original of her life spanned years of incredible change change for women to Mary lived through an era of liberating reform for women, that definitely would work. So here the what you'd have to do is, as Johnson states, again giving credit, but there's no quotes here because you've paraphrased it. So keep in mind that's what you need to do. Use very few quotes and when you paraphrase give credit and make sure you're putting it in your own words, not just changing a couple of words here and there. All right, homework. So a couple of questions you need to answer. One, if you look at this fact up here, tell me, does it need to be cited? I.e., do you have to give credit to the author? Why or why not? Then here's another example. Again, do you need to cite this? Giving credit to a source or an author? Why or why not? Three, how is a paraphrase different from a quote? Four, name one concern about Google. And five, practice what we just talked about, right? Bring in either digitally, meaning you can have it on your laptop or something or a tablet, two sources. Has to be two for your approved speech topic. And remember, I sent out those approvals or I've either talked to you verbally about what I approved. One must be from the school's database. One must be obtained from Google search function. So either the news article,